as a woodworker, sometimes I make stuff like this. But in order for me to make this type of stuff, I need these. I got a lot of these and I need to put them somewhere. So we're gonna make a box. And in doing so, I'm gonna go over all the tips and tricks and random things that I've learned over all the box making times that I've made boxes. I don't know if that fully made sense, but it did up here. What I'll do is whenever there's a good little trick or something, I'll just um, put it down here somewhere. Here's kind of the general rule of thumb, the golden ratio. It's said to be visually the ideal ratio between one thing and another thing, which to us is gonna be the length or the width. To calculate the golden ratio, we just need to know the number, 1.618. If we know that the box is gonna be a certain width, we just take that number and we times it by 1.618. That's gonna tell us the length of the box. It works the other way around too. You can take the length of the box and then divide it by 1.618 and it gives you the width. Now, obviously none of this matters if it doesn't serve its function. So it's kind of like a, a guideline, not the rule, obviously. Here's how I know the golden ratio actually makes sense. My visual rule for boxes is five by eight. And that was before I even knew what the golden ratio was. Well, then I learned about the golden ratio. And then I saw that when you do the math, it's creepy, right? As far as the height goes, I usually go with about uh, three inches, but you know, these aren't very thick. So I'll probably go a little bit smaller just to save room. I spend a lot of time working on materials because frankly, if I'm gonna spend all this time making a box, I don't want to look like booty. So, you know, I'm gonna take the extra effort. We'll try this one. I cleaned up one face over the joiner so we can actually see what we're working with. And not too bad, really. There's a really nice flowing grain down the sides of it. That's gonna be perfect for the long sides of the box. You don't wanna have the stop start of the cathedral grain, the flat saw and cut that's in the middle of the board. The problem with having that is visually, it just messes it all up. Instead of having that flow, it's just this choppiness. And it really makes the box look a little bit smaller than what it really is. I wanna find the best looking grate on the board. I'm gonna use that for the long sides. And then any other pieces that are eh, not so great, but I still have to use them, I'll put those on the ends, on the short sides, because, well, there's less material there, so you won't really notice as much. Based off the thickness of this board, next step is uh, cut it into pieces. Maybe you thought I was gonna say something way more insightful than that. This isn't a very big box, so I just resawed my boards in half. That saves a little bit of material, which in turn saves a little bit of money. As far as the thickness of the box sides, go to number about three eighths. You can go a little bit under, you can go a little bit over, but usually three eighths is about that sweet spot. Now, if you start getting a little bit wider than that, then I would say the box probably should get bigger because otherwise it looks kind of kind of chunky. Nobody wants a chunky box. Good rule of thumb is to always check that blade, make sure it's at 90 degrees to the table, and then check your miter gauge, make sure it's 90 degrees to the blade. Don't assume it's already at 90 because it may not be. I squared up the ends. Now here's something that often gets overlooked. That's using a stop block, even if you're just cutting to one side. We're used to setting a stop block where we wanna cut a particular size, but in this case, I'm not really looking for a size. I just need to make sure this end is square. Oh, and you hold the board against that fence and you make a cut, but you don't have a stop block here. It's very easy for that board to kind of move a little bit and then you don't have a square end. So I always recommend a stop block, even if this side is still rough. When you make the first cut on that end, check it and make sure it's actually 90 degrees because nothing's worse than making a cut and then you already think it's 90, you flip it around, you cut the other end, now it's at the perfect size you want, you put the square up to it and you realize it's not square. So check the first one before you cut the second one. You better check yourself before you wreck yourself. What I like about resawing boards is now you can do some cool wraparound grain effects because I take my boards and I flay them out, I get a book match panel. Kind of like you would do for like a cabinet or something. But now I can rotate them and put them end to end. And I can see that the grain flows from one board into the other. And the same thing works if I flip them around and I put the other ends together. The grain just flows into the next. I have a whole video on how to do wraparound grain for boxes, so I'll, I'll try to link it down in the description if you want to check it out. At this point, it's time to cut these two pieces into four pieces. So back to the table saw.
Time for joinery, and well, I got a couple options. I could go with miter joints, one of my favorite joints. They're also one of the weaker ones, and I've done a lot of them recently. I could go dovetails, which is probably the strongest joint, but I'm not really a dovetail fan, so I think I'm gonna go in between, do box joints. If you already have a kerf in your sled or your miter gauge, put a sacrificial board to cover it up. This will give you a clean surface. Otherwise, if you lower your blade below the kerf you already have cut, you're gonna get some tear out. When cutting joinery, if you rotate your board around, you're gonna get perfectly symmetrical cuts. Keeping this in mind, it's best to cut both sides before you move that stop lock. A dado stack works great for joints, but if you don't have one, opt for a flat tooth ripping blade, because that's gonna give you a clean, squared off cut for your joinery. When cutting large box joints, you don't actually have to measure the mating piece for each joint. Line them up, place a mark, and cut them. That easy. Cut away material till you get close to the line, then set a stop block and sneak up on that fit. Or you can just watch the video that I have that's dedicated to this entire process. I'll put a link down in the description. Not too bad. So now I gotta cut grooves for the top and the bottom. Well, there's two ways to do that. I can go over to the table saw and cut them or go to the router. The thing with the table saw is I'm gonna have an entry point and an exit point as that blade goes through. And well, I've got the, the box joints there. That means you're gonna see a notch cut out and you don't want that. Instead, I'll go over to the router table and I'll do a stop cut. So I'll stop the bit just short of exiting the board. That way there won't be a hole there. When I cut the channel for the top and the bottom, I wanna make sure that I have at least an eighth inch between the top and then the top edge here. Anything less than that, I don't know. It just feels like it could break. Automobile manufacturers spend a considerable amount of time and money on the sound that their door makes whenever you close it. Because whenever you close that door and you hear that deep thud, your brain perceives that as, ooh, this is quality. And most of the time, you don't even realize that you think that. Psychology. Same thing applies to box bottoms. If the box bottom is thin, then it doesn't sound as good. Listen to this. This one's a little bit thicker. Not much, a little bit thicker though. a deeper thud noise. So this is what I recommend. I would say don't go under a quarter inch. You start going under a quarter inch, you hear that tap noise compared to that thud noise. So always go quarter inch, five sixteenths. Yeah, that's a good measurement. You don't have to measure the length and width of your box bottom. Just put a combination square in there, set it, put it up on each edge and place a mark. You can put your box bottom on that and mark where those marks are at. You can do it this way too. Whatever you marked across the width of it, remove maybe about a 16th of an inch extra. That gives you a little bit of wiggle room in case that board expands and contracts over the seasons, it doesn't break your box. For something like this, you don't need to cut off a whole lot. The front of the box has to be shorter than the rest of it because that lid is gonna slide in and out. But whenever I was at the router, I did route a channel for the lid, even though I didn't need it. And the reason being is because now I know exactly where to cut. So I just have to cut from where that channel is up to the top edge, remove that part, I'm good to go. To sand the top and the bottom edges of boxes, sometimes, you know, the top or the bottom is not exactly perfect. 
Some sandpaper on a piece of MDF or plywood works perfect for this. We need a lid for the box. And when it comes to lids, my take on it is, have fun. Use like the craziest figure you can find or use like contrasting woods, whatever it is. Just this is your opportunity to really have fun with it. For this one, I found a piece of walnut that I had sitting over to the side and it is beautiful, all kinds of nice grain and is gonna elevate the look of this box. That is a good looking lid. Last thing that needs to go on here is something to be able to uh, pull it out, right? Usually you just take a chisel, cut a little divot in that lid, you can put your thumb in there and you can pull the lid out. Or you can do what I do, which is just take a piece of scrap wood and it's the same width as the thickness of the box sides and just drop that dude in place and it looks like it was always meant to be there. I know somebody might be worried about this piece being glued across the grain of the lid. I can say that I've made a million of these. I've never had a problem with that. We're also dealing with very tiny pieces that aren't gonna move very much, but you gotta go off your own experiences. Now it's time for one of my favorite parts of the whole box making experience, which is applying that first coat of finish on it. Now, when it comes to finishing, I recommend something that has a close to the wood feel. As in, if you put a bunch of lacquer and poly all over this, and you put a bunch of coats on it, then it kind of feels like you're touching plastic and not wood. Instead, I would prefer like a, an oil, a hard wax, something where it actually feels like you're touching the wood itself and plus they're just beautiful. And if I do use poly, I like to thin it down with a little bit of mineral spirits and a little bit of tongue oil in that. It's a good combination for a box. This box is a little bit too classy for scroll saw blades. I'm 100% sure that I will definitely keep all my stuff organized in this box and it won't end up scattered anywhere around the shop. It's all the little touches with this one. The wraparound grain, the bigger box joints, and oh, the walnut. Oh, the walnut. If you want to see how I made the gorilla wearing a hoodie, head on over to my second channel, Newton Makes Art. It's all scroll saw stuff, so you might like it. And a big thank you to the Super Road community over on Patreon for voting on this dude and putting me through my paces, you guys rock. And to meet again, get into your shop and build something awesome.